over and over the local laws of the land? Well, it hasn't happened yet, but it is part of the process which is now in train that policing should be transnational right across the European Union. Um, the, the obvious manifestation we already have in place is the European arrest warrant, which in effect means that the police in one country can apply to the police in another country and say, will you please arrest this man on these charges and send him to us? Now, under normal uh, circumstances before, if a country did that, then in the UK at least, uh, that individual who was being uh, accused would have the right, the absolute unqualified right, for his defence to be heard in an open British court, and he would have the opportunity to refute the allegations, and a British judge, British court, would then decide whether or not he should be extradited to an uh, and tried in another country. All of that has been abolished. Anybody in the European Union is now vulnerable to any other country in the EU applying for a warrant to have that person on the flimsiest of grounds, if necessary, and possibly even uh, on the grounds of a charge or an accusation that would not even break the law in the country from which he or she comes, they can have they can they have the right to demand that that person is extradited without any um, restriction whatsoever or any hearing of the case in uh, the UK before they are removed to stand trial wherever it might be. That is monstrous. That is absolutely monstrous. So but it is the first step. It is the first step towards a fully integrated policing um, across the EU. Uh, there is no doubt that eventually there would be uh, a common uh, system of policing with all the databases and uh, that's already happening, um, being exchanged and um, obviously in, in due course it would require common uh, criminal law to be introduced, but uh, we haven't got that far yet. But that's undoubtedly the direction in which we're going. So a person who would be um, charged with a crime would no longer be tried under, we'll say, British law, was, uh, where he's presumed innocent to proven guilty and entitled to a uh, jury of his peers and the other protections under the law. They would be under uh, European law. Uh, do, do the regular, do common people understand the um, significance that this will bring to them? Well, I don't think most people do. I, as I understand it, and I'm, I'm not uh, sure of my facts here, or my current facts, as I understand it, already several hundred people have been extradited from the UK on charges brought in other countries against them without their case being heard in the UK first. Several hundred. Now, ironically, uh, you remember this uh, fuss over um, Julian Assange, the uh, Willy Leakes Swedish. Yes. The Swedes want him from the UK. But he's Australian. So ironically, his case will have to go before a British court to be heard and he can defend himself against that um, accusation and hopefully, or from his point of view, he can refute the case and have it thrown out and then he would not be extradited. So a foreigner, uh, i.e. somebody from outside the EU, still has that protection. But a British national has lost it. Now that is lunacy. I mean, <laughs> it's indescribably wrong, uh, stupid, unjust, um, but this is the way the European Union works. It doesn't have any regard for the respect that is due to an individual. Uh, they are all regarded as, if you like, part of the system. 
the sovereignty of the individual has been lost. And I'm, I'm drawn towards the fact that there, there is a profound difference between, in the UK particularly, and the rest of the EU. The key to all this is the sovereignty of the individual. And here, we are sovereign in our own land. And that is not the case in many other European countries. Will that understanding of sovereignty may not be understood by the regular people on the street anymore? We'll say if you went back 50 or 75 years, it was a given and people understood that they were sovereign and they uh, were independent entities. But an, an, an element of dependency seems to have been bred into the people where now they um, see themselves as being cogs in a big wheel and dependent on, on the state for everything. Um, yes, absolutely right. And, and, and that is part of the process. I mean, that, that was actually listed in those points I read out at the beginning yeah. um, about the uh, uh, ideas put forward from the Frankfurt Communist School. Um, but you see, sovereignty is not something uh, which can be diluted or given away, especially if it's not in the power of the people who have chosen to give it, which is exactly what happened with the Edward Heath situation. He did not have the power to overthrow the Constitution of the UK. Um, but that is exactly what, in effect, has happened. And it is unlawful. There's no question about that. We are a constitutional monarchy in the UK. We're also the centre of the Commonwealth. We're, we're at the very heart of the Anglo-Saxon world. What on earth were we doing getting tangled up with our European neighbours in this kind of way? Having them as friends and neighbours was one thing. Allowing them to become masters in our house was something else again. Intolerable. Well, speaking of the monarchy, <coughs> if Europe proceeds like it is doing and forms itself into a, a huge federal state, where does that leave the, the monarchy itself in Britain? Is that to be swept into the bin of history? And if so, has the Queen not authority to um, put a stop to everything that's happening, or is she, I, what is the understanding there? Are they just been swept along with the flow? Well, I, I, that's a very good question, and it's a, a key one because uh, the Queen is a constitutional monarch. Um, her status as a constitutional monarch is not, repeat, not dependent on Parliament. It exists outside of Parliament. And the Queen, the monarch, whoever that might be at any time, is the uh, supreme head of the nation. Now, if I can just grab a note here somewhere, I can refer you to the, uh, to the right of um, 1688, which is still... Um, a treaty between the sovereign, whoever that sovereign is, and the people of the United Kingdom. And the Bill of Rights quite clearly says that all usurped and foreign power and authority may forever be clearly extinguished and never used or obeyed in this realm. No foreign prince, person, prelate, state, or potentate shall at any time after the last day of this session of Parliament, use, enjoy, or exercise any manner of power, jurisdiction, superiority, authority, preeminence, or privilege within this realm. Now, okay, that's old-fashioned legal language. But the point I'm making is this. It is still the law. And he broke the law when he attempted to ignore that piece of our Constitution. And it doesn't go away because you haven't exercised it. It doesn't die because it hasn't been used. It's still there. And if you're talking strictly UK constitutional issues here, the fact of the matter is that we are, we are unlawfully members of the EU. Unfortunately, none of us have been able to find the resources and the lawyers to help prove that in a court of law. But that's the fact. 
and most British governments since that time, unfortunately, uh, and I'm talking about Heath when I say since that time, have chosen to ignore this uh, legal conflict which still exists to this very day and will go on existing until either we change our constitution, which I don't think there are any plans to do, or we leave the U European Union. Is it true then that, keeping this old law in, in mind, that the Queen or the monarch at the time as any, uh, could use this law to, um, to really wrest power back from the Parliament? Is it, uh, the question I'm asking is, I, I read someplace that in an emergency situation that the monarch can declare an emergency and to rule directly herself, uh, through the Privy Council. Is that the situation or is it not? Um, she could. That is undoubtedly the case. She has the power to dismiss Parliament at any time. That's what she does every five years anyway. Because the Prime Minister of the day, when his term of office is up, he has to invite the Queen to dismiss Parliament and call a general election. He can't do it. She does it. Now, the convention is different uh, in that over recent decades, uh, if not more than a century, um, with one exception in 1911, the constitutional custom has been that the Queen or the monarch at the time merely approves whatever Parliament has already decided. But there have been cases in recent years, and I was involved directly in one with the Treaty of Nice in the year 2000, and it's happened again uh, with the Lisbon Treaty um, two years ago, where an, a group of us have exercised our right under Magna Carta, which was signed by the monarch of the day in 1215, I guess, before Parliament even existed, demanding that the sovereign act in accordance with uh, the sovereign's obligations to the people, us, uh, to protect our best interests. Now, in fact, in the year 2000, we got as far as having a petition taken by a group of lords to Her, Her Majesty herself. It was presented at Buckingham Palace, and it demanded that she... Um, do not sign uh, the Treaty of Nice. Now, the law, the the uh, clause in Magna Carta that we were using said that the sovereign has to respond within 40 days. And would you believe, on the 39th day, we got a reply uh, acknowledging the uh, petition, but saying that she was taking the advice of her ministers. Now, in fact, she didn't actually sign it ever. The, the um, cabinet waited until she'd gone abroad to Australia on a, an official visit, and then the um, council of ministers that acts on her behalf when she is out of the country signed the Nice Treaty for her on behalf of the British people. That's a very yeah, intriguing words, story. Yeah, it was a con. Uh, and she knew that they would do it, but there was no more she could do um, than, in effect, delay signing it. She accepted the force of that um, petition under Magna Carta. So, so perhaps a more forceful monarch in the future might resist that. And, uh... One would hope so. Well, I'm not holding my breath. Well, not for the next generation, but perhaps the generation after it. Which well, that's what we have to hope. Well, that is a very intriguing thing. Okay, Ashley, we'd like to take a small break there uh, to dwell upon that for a moment. Uh, just bear with me, please.